alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the sixth episode of the MH podcast, the Muhammad Hijab podcast. I'm here with two very special guests, two very notable individuals that are contributing contributing to the academic uh, kind of work and knowledge production in the Muslim world. We have Dr. Shadi Al Masri, who is a teacher in the Safin uh, Institute. Is that correct? Safina Institute. Yeah, Safina Society. Yep. Safina Society. Apologies for that. And we have, um, of course, Dr. Uh, professor Jonathan Brown, who um, is well known uh, and also a professor in, um, what's the name of the university again? Is it, uh, it's not Chicago, is it? It's Georgetown. Is it Georgetown? That's correct. Georgetown University. <laughs> no, because you, you, not, you, to be, you not, to be, not to be mistaken with George Washington University, which is ah, that's Washington, D.C. It's, <laughs> it's all in the air now because you went to George Washington University, didn't you? You did your, your master. Ah. Uh, yeah, I went to GW, yep. Yeah, and you done your PhD in, in Chicago University. So it's all these names are in the air. So we're trying it's to... All yeah, near. I, I was going to bag on George Washington, uh, Shadi, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't want to be I don't want to be rude. Well, with the consortium, I was able to take one third of all my classes at Georgetown. So I did enjoy that nice, musty library downstairs. <laughs> and I spent hours there. I took classes with Scott Redford, almost all my yeah. classes. Yeah, That's really was interesting. Great. He was, he was into guy. like uh, Islamic art, right? Uh, J- Scott Redford, his dad was like um, some politician who ended up being ambassador in Lebanon. And he fell in love with the Middle East. So he went to yeah. Harvard. He became an Islamic arts and architecture you know, guy and ends up uh, being teaching at Georgetown. So Very his nice. classes were yeah. really good. Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. What I wanted to talk to you guys about today was some of the controversial... Uh, things that have been in the air in terms of our approaches as Muslims, as the Muslim community to the LGBT rights movement. Uh, Now, I think we're all on the same page uh, from my reading of your works in terms of how we view uh, a man having sex with another man, for example, the act itself and the impermissibility of the act as per the Islamic edicts and uh, understandings. The question really isn't about this. Uh, The question is about how do we engage as the Muslim community with uh, LGBT uh, groups? Now, um, what I wanted to do is because obviously on the Yaqeen website, you have, you've, um, Dr. Jonathan Brown has written an article, which uh, Dr. Shadi Masri then responds to. It's kind of like a refutation of that, um, of that article. So what I wanted um, Dr. Jonathan Brown, or is it Professor Jonathan Brown, I get confused. Hey, there. hang on, Let, let's just, I, I think maybe we can just go yeah. with, I'm Jack. That's Shaddy. I think Shaddy, are you okay with that? Works for me. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, we're going to spend half the half the podcast is going to be <laughs> saying our names. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So far, Jack, um, can you outline your position in terms of what is this ratio um, idea that you've had? Uh, yeah. Where did you get this idea from? How did you come to this conclusion? And then we'll get uh, Shaddy to respond. Inshallah. Okay, I mean, uh, sorry, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having us on. Uh, it's always a real pleasure to talk to people in the UK or wherever is watching this in the universe, right? Um, I, I think, uh, first of all, I, I think you actually introduced the issue really well, uh, which is, you know, when, when, when we, when we at Yaqeen, so me and Omar, sorry, Sheikh Omar, right? When me and Sheikh Omar, um, I, we're talking about doing this, right? So it was back, you go back to kind of 2015, there's the Obergefell Supreme Court ruling in the United States, which basically makes gay legal, gay marriage illegal in the United States uh, everywhere. And 2016, there was a discussion at AMJA, the American Muslim Jurist Association. Uh, I think it was in Texas. I can't remember where in Texas it was that year. So in AMJA, there's like a whole discussion about this issue, about the gay marriage ruling and how Muslims should like, fiqhi position themselves and then socially position themselves so um and like exactly the same issue the kind of exactly the same things that shadi and i were discussing in that count count pointer point counterpoint came up in that discussion so our our aim with that point counterpoint was uh, yakin was basically to say okay let's let's show very clearly what's agreed upon right so the religious issue we want to show there's no disagreement on this so there's no disagreement about Liwat is haram. In Islam, we have a certain understanding of sex and gender. Let's just put let's let's put that aside so that that's not going to get questioned because otherwise, 
we're going to go down the path of Muslims questioning things that are ma'lum in Adin Badurura in our religion. Okay, well, before we continue with, with the words in Arabic, can you translate them? Yeah, they're... okay. So things that are known as, you know, axiomatically as part of the faith. For example, the prohibition yeah. on, on, on homosexual acts in Islam is, is qat'i, right? It's, it's absolutely certain. It's known from the Quran, from the Sunnah, from fiqh, from ijma, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, so let's, the idea was like, let's put this religious, like dini issue aside, and then we'll be, we're going to talk about the political question. So one, now Muslims, you know, we can very clearly articulate what our religious views are. How do we deal socially and politically with the challenges in our society? So that was the idea. It was like me and Shadi are going to kind of, or Shadi was, you know, he wasn't part of the discussion yet, right? But it was the idea is like, we're going to set kind of show the religious parameters very clearly and then within the we're going to get into the political discussion and there we're going to show what the different perspectives are so i was going to come out with this idea of kind of engagement and notion of kind of pluralism and create you know promoting a sort of soft liberal pluralistic society in which different groups can kind of pursue their own moral religious visions or lifestyles under a, a shared protection of rights uh, and Shadi was, you know, obviously going to take the position he took. So that was, it was really about having like a political discussion about how the American Muslim community was going to position itself socially and politically on this important issue. Um, One question just before you continue. On. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if everyone would agree <clears throat> that the two spheres are mutually exclusive. So in the sense that, you know, we can have a discussion about Liwat and so on. And that is a strictly political discussion with no um, kind of religious ramifications. What do you think, Shadi, quickly, before we continue with this, because there seems to be an assumption here that... Wait, wait, hang on. I would, I would just want to say, I actually completely agree with you, right? So that, that's, okay. that's, that, that's exactly the kind of ground we wanted to feel out in this discussion. Sorry, okay, go ahead, Shadi. Yeah, Shadi, well, what's your position? Yeah. There's, it's a very important point, you know, that, that Jonathan making, and, and uh, it, what he's not doing, what is not, it's not separating between religion and politics, but it's really separating between what's and what is up for what's a nazila, a new matter that requires maybe some qiyas. Translate the, translate the word, sorry. A nazila is a new matter that we are facing right now, yep. which requires an ijtihad. We're not talking about ijtihad like the four madhabs level ijtihad, but we are forced to make a qiyas. Uh, uh, based upon, and we're forced to make a decision. So what is that? What that does is it removes this, uh, the the difference of opinion from one of which would render a person like a kafir rejecting that which is known in religion, yeah. uh, zindiq. So it removes it from that and brings it into the sphere of a difference of opinion. I might feel that you're you're holding something that's sinful. But Shadi, there's one thing I would want to just kind of probe you on here with this. Sure. I agree with the fact that no one's trying to classify anyone. Like, you know, that's not definitely not what we're trying to do. We respect, I think everyone respects one another here and we don't yeah. Yeah. do that here. But this dichotomy of either it being uh, something which is within the religious scope, that is difference of opinion, or uh, something which renders someone a kafir, is something which someone might object to. Someone could say there's a third option here. The third option is that what you're saying is batil, it was outside of the religious parameters. Um, and it doesn't render you a kafir or a mubtada or a fasak or whatever. Uh, that, that is there as well. Like in the religious literature, many things, uh, batil meaning false, right? outright false. So uh, from a religious perspective, so the works of Ibn Hazm or the works of any of the scholars, they uh, will be things in them which we could consider as batil, as incorrect. As, uh, correct, incorrect. exactly. That's right. exactly but it's not, it's not gonna, we're not gonna now, you know, use this to try and classify that individual as X, Y, or Z. That's a kafir, Yeah, or even let's say we don't classify him, but the view itself, we, we've exited al, uh, al kufr and the bit and heresy, bid'ah, uh, from we've exited that realm to a view that can be either batil or so, or you know, yeah, uh, yeah. So, correct. No, but know? if it, 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 I once again, I, I don't think there's a problem with if someone says the view is bid'ah. It's different from saying that someone, and once again, this is, I'm sure everyone here knows it, but for the, for the um, kind of average viewer who's watching this, if, if someone says this view that, for example, uh, Dr. Brown has, is bid'ah, is, is yeah. something which is newly invented into the religion for the sake of argument, it doesn't mean now that he is the, that, right? 
or right. someone who's right. an innovator. So yeah, which but, is somebody I mean, but, that. Look, but look, yeah. like of course, yeah, of course this is bidal. Like that's the point of a nazila, right? The, the idea right. of a nazila of uh, this is we ha Muslims have not been in a position that we know of in history. In fact, as far as I know, no society has been in a position that we are in now regarding how modern Western societies view sexuality and gender. Like this is, it's, 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 a, it's a novel. So any, you know, whatever our discussion and our potential solutions are almost certainly going to be unprecedented yeah. in our tradition. Uh, so I, I think that like using words like, I mean, I'm not, I know you're not trying to attack yeah. me or something, but I mean, I think when we start talking about words like bid'a, it's like, yeah, like obviously there's, we're in, a, uh, we're in an unprecedented situation. We're just trying to figure out what is the way that we, uh, as Muslims, I think, I, 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 Shadi, I, you can disagree with me if you, if you do, but I mean, I think our, both of our objectives are how do we as Muslims preserve our faith and our community? How do we do Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar in the best yeah. way in our society? How do we preserve our religion and spread it, right? Yeah. Because this is wisdom and andillah that we believe benefits people dunya wa akhirah, right? So mm. how do we do that best? Yeah. That's, the, that's the discussion. Yeah. So what is your position? How would you outline it in a nutshell? Like, um, I've read obviously your article and um, you, you kind of c categorized or classified different views, the rejectionist view, the neutralist view, um, and then you had your own racial view. So how would you now, in terms of trying to abbreviate it in as um, least words as possible, what is your view in terms of how we should do the LGBT uh, movement? You know, oh, well, first of all, by the way, Shadi, like if, I, if yeah. I'm talking too much, just, you know, go like this and be like, hey, man, you've been talking too much. No problem. I'll put my hand up. Because I don't, I, don't I don't want to distract <laughs> from your, your chance, right? No problem. So, I mean, I, I, this is going to really annoy you, Muhammad, but I actually don't think you can talk about it succinctly. Why? because the situation has changed so much since that article was written, right? So we wrote that article, yeah, we wrote that article, I think it was 2017. I can't remember when it was, but like that's, um, it was a very beginning of Trump era, I think, right? So things have changed so much. Like that article in some ways is like, it's obsolete, not because, um, because the discussion around the LGBT, the LGBT discussion has moved so far. Hmm. So, things like gay marriage are, are not even an issue anymore. Now it's issues of like gender, how we understand gender in schools, how we talk mm -hmm. about uh, discrimination and things like that. What our kids are going to be taught in school and public schools. So that's, I think the bigger issue. And so, but I, I'd say like, you could look at it as an, as a developing discussion. Um, and so in that sense, what I would say is the, the question I was trying to or the point I was trying to make in the ratio, which I think means rights, affirmation, common cause, Islamic orthodoxy, or something like that. I just made it up when I was writing the article. Um, yeah. Is kind of what is the vision we have for the United States as a country, right? So uh, one vision would be this kind of, um, one could call it kind of Abrahamic tent vision, right? So, which is that the United States is sort of this Judeo-Christian, Muslim, theistic nation that honors God, even though it, it grants religious liberty. It's sort of the, the substrate of the country is one that respects revelation, that kind of has a, a respects natural law, respects like human human beings linked to his own or her own nature, right? And that, that nature means something, that it, it has some degree of claim or control over us, that our own subjective identity doesn't determine our nature. Um, and it, so th that would be one vision, right? Um, and that sort of Muslims would be allowed to function and flourish in that society. Uh, the, the criticism of that would be that the Christian right in this country is simply too Islamophobic and too hostile to Muslims historically and in the present to really allow Muslims uh, to exist in this country. Uh, and this the evidence for this would be things like the fact that in 43 states now, there have either been passed or proposed anti-Sharia bills that make it illegal to follow Sharia in those states. Um, and you can imagine, by the way, what that means potentially about things like marriage, like Dr. Shadi's marriage or my marriage, right? I have a Sharia marriage, which I have a little mm -hmm. certificate from the mosque. Someone can come and say, you've broken the law by having this marriage. I, that hasn't happened yet, but that's just potentially what might happen, right? Um, 
And the other vision is, the, and the, the kind of ratio vision was uh, that this country would be much more like pluralistic, diverse, demographically, pluralistic, morally, even legally, right? And that you can imagine almost like a millet system in the Islamic tradition where you have basically little communities. So there's Amish people here, there's Christian people here, there's Muslim people there. The Muslims have their own schools, they have their own social associations, right? And that the, the law is, the actual law of the land is, is, is very minimal in the way it imposes moral or cultural views on these different communities. So that's much more what we, co- we talk in political science as like kind of a soft liberalism. So if you're familiar with South Africa, much more like South Africa, where, you know, polygamy is legal, uh, all sorts of different animal sacrifice is legal because you have such a culturally diverse country. Where as opposed to what the United States is now and Britain is now, which is much more of a hard liberal state where, yeah, there's freedom of religion. Yeah, there's freedom of, of you know, moral beliefs. But really, like there's, exp- you know, you, polygamy is allowed certain beliefs are considered intolerant, certain beliefs, speech is considered hate speech, right? So I was really arguing that the U.S. should go in the kind of a more morally pluralistic, diverse direction. But I think the problem is, and this will be the last thing I say, um, because I know we've been talking for a long time, which is if you look at the development of American law since that article was written in 2017, it's we've gone further down, the, not we've, we haven't gone down the path towards something that would make the ratio um, view possible, we've gone the other way, right? Which we've actually become more uh, hegemonic. There's like more of a hegemonic um, progressivism and liberalism in our society. Uh, And actually right now, literally right now, in the next few months, we're going to see with the Supreme Court decision on what's called St. James School, we're going to see, I think, whether there's going to be the final nail in the possibility for a really morally and religiously plural country or, uh, if that, or if that's going to be allowed. I want to ask you one question, one question before I get uh, Shadi on, if that's all right, because um, I think there's still something to be said about the main controversy about this particular uh, essay. So let me read something that you've written. You said, according to the Rashua position, American Muslims should support the right of gay marriage under U.S. law. This is really the crux of the problem here uh, in terms of uh, controversy, because people are saying, on what grounds, on what Islamic grounds, um, when you say the word should here, is this what, in mubah, is it uh, is dihbab, is it, is it wujub, is it obligatory, is it recommended? What, what is the classification that you're making it? I mean, when you're saying we should, uh, in fact, engage in so much as we would um, support the right of gay marriage, doesn't this seem very contrary um, to the da'wah of Lut alayhi salam, for example, who very much was opposed to these kinds of practices, let alone facilitated it. On what Islamic... I don't think Lut, I don't think Lut alayhi salam talked about gay marriage. Well, he talked about uh, sex between man and man. Right? Okay, I mean, look, if, if we want to talk about sex between men and sex between women, that's mm-hmm. haram. Like if someone comes and asks me, you know, what should Muslims say about liwat? They should say, this is haram. And they should do Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar on that. They should say, this is, this is considered sinful in my religion. And I don't believe it's pleasing to God. The, okay, doesn't, that's the, it defy, doesn't it defy common sense that if the thing is haram, then the thing which leads to it and facilitates it is... No, because, you, because you're not, I mean, you don't, uh, I don't know, you know, not to get too graphic, but you don't need to be married to do this stuff, right? So like, it's legal. Like this, Liwat is legal in the United States. That's since, no, since, the, that. yeah, since the early we, 2000s. Why support, I mean, why as Muslims do we need to support gay yeah. uh, marriage in particular? Why have you recommended this? With I, don't, I, don't, I don't support gay marriage. I support the right to marriage for gay people. Why? Why is that? Because, because I, I want the same. What is, look at what, what is the, what was the gay marriage case about? It didn't say, it wasn't, you know, can gays get married? It was... Is does the government have a right to say that marriage is only between a man and a woman? That's the that's the debate, right? Now, okay. my marriage and my marriage as a Muslim is nothing to do with the U.S. government. My marriage is between is a contract between me and my wife, my wife's family, mm-hmm. in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That's it. Like it doesn't matter if the U.S. government acknowledges that or not. 
Okay, so this is the, the, like Muslim marriage and, and what is pleasing to God is one thing, right? Now we have to look at the issue. What, what is the, I have a question. Do you want the U.S. government to say that marriage, the only marriage that's going to be legally recognized is between a man and a woman? I'm not politically uh, active in that sense. I don't, I'm not trying to persuade the U.S. government to do anything. Okay, so I, what I want, I'll yeah, tell you what I want. What my, my I want, position, yeah, yeah. My position on, on my personal position on the matter is that, it, it, for me, the kind of defies um, common sense, especially if you're trying to use maslaha type arguments. Um, like w at one point, it seemed like you were trying to insinuate that because it's kind of daruri, it's kind of necessity now that we need these people to help us in order to. They're, they're the only one, one of the only groups that help us, which is questionable actually, the, the gay uh, rights groups. That they, so that we should help them in in, in kind. So I'm what, not. I don't. I don't. I don't think that. I say very. Actually, I say very explicitly in the article. This is not a quid pro quo. This is not a quid pro quo. Because yeah. it would be. We are not allowed to advocate for something that's haram because somebody did something nice for us. So is gay marriage halal then? Of course not. What do you? What? What? You? I'm sorry to get upset, yeah. but like, what universe? Are people in that they think right. it's halal like not only is it not halal but i've okay. written the most extensive article rebutting any arguments that it is halal in islam okay so, if you oh, say oh, that yeah. zawaj zawaj rajulain bil islam halal bil islam we're not saying for islam okay no th yeah. then but you said the word halal halal means yeah. halal in islam okay not in islam. If you want to say if you want to say legal or not legal yeah, yeah. That's not. That's not even. It is legal. That that was already. That decision was made before this article was written, right? It's illegal, and it's it is legal in the United States, right? Uh, so my but I just don't get it. Like that is for, for So is are you are you arguing on maslaha ground? So let me let me uh may, may, may me repackage. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Shadi, go ahead because you wrote a ref refutation. What what is okay, your? So what I think Jack was just saying right now, is yeah. that he's arguing that he does not want the government involved in making moral claims and deciding. And what's your position on that? What's that's your a libertarian view. Okay, right. what's your position on the matter? What do you see as, uh, you've written a response, so what- Okay, so one of my things is when I read uh, this, about this interaction between the Muslims and the law, etc. one of the articles that you could read that also summarizes something, I don't know if it's exactly Jonathan's opinion, but at the end, Professor Fadl, Muhammad Fadl from Toronto, mm. he writes in his article, basically summarizes, uh, his position is that if we allow uh, discrimination against gays in the workplace, you open the door for Muslims to be discriminated against in the workplace. That's his argument, right? Now he has to come upon the issue is, okay, well, are we therefore, are we uh, supporting something that Allah prohibited by doing this, by backing that group? Are we therefore backing something that Allah prohibited? He says, and this is where I'm going to, Note my, note my disagreement and note where you know the seeds of secularism are really in his article he notes that we are obligated as muslims to uphold the contracts that we are upon and we're upon this you know uh um, constitution and these uh, of the u.s and therefore by advocating and supporting and fulfilling those laws we're doing our job because the prophet said and to him believers have to observe their contracts now my response to him is that pr protecting covenants and contracts, that's, that part is correct. But there's a condition that the contract is valid and not what you, we said also about it, right? So my, my response to him is that we're only supposed to observe contracts that are in line with the Sharia. Now, let's say, well, all of us, our citizenship, we're bound by... Uh, laws of nations that you know we would never author right and aren't even valid for us okay however they became binding upon us by virtue of our birth it that, it, that doesn't necessarily mean we support them right so there's a big there's a there, this is tough seal we are constantly separating between matters just right. because something is bound upon me doesn't necessarily mean i support it all right i'm stuck with it what can i do okay uh, but i'm not forced to support it just because I benefit from something. And that's what Jonathan uh, Jack was saying. Just because I benefit from something does not necessarily mean I got to go and support it, right? 
Uh, so that's those were my couple uh, uh, other points uh, on the issue of this idea of supporting the rights of LGBT just because the Muslims will also benefit from that. I would say, OK, yes, I may benefit, but I will sit back and watch. Right. I'm not going to actively support. I may benefit. I may not. Right. So uh, th those were my points. And my main issues were yeah. the separation of a political judgment from a fiqhi judgment. OK, or, for, or from a moral judgment right? as a method. That's a problem. And as a and, and as a concept of um, covenants, we can't forget the condition for which we are to support a, a, a contract or a covenant or a law or whatever is that it's valid in the Sharia by the view of the Sharia. All right. So yes, the Tasawwur yeah. Shari. Yeah, yeah. So for me, the, the, what I was thinking immediately is that, and um, Dr. Brown, I think we're going to run out in five minutes, so we're going to have to restart the session. Uh, if it does cut out, then we'll just start again. Yeah, the um, session. Um, so. I was thinking in my mind about, okay, so if we're arguing from maslaha, which it seems like effectively this is what this is, an argument from darur and maslaha, then maslaha can be, you know, maslaha mula'am, maslaha mulga, it can be maslaha mursala. But in this situation, it seems that it's very clear, maslaha mulga, meaning something which is, as you mentioned, the shari, something which is in opposition to the sharia. Mm -hmm. Argument here is that if it's something which you can, if it's mursala, if it's something which is mubah, and the Sharia hasn't spoken about it, or if it's mulatim, obviously the Sharia allows it itself, it mentions it in its text, then it's different. But the issue here is that you have this issue. If we take, for example, the, the view that uh, gay marriage outside of Islamic law, which is, I think, the argument you're going to make, is in fact maslaha musala, and it's not mulha, then you have a third, you have a secondary problem, which is what Al-Ghazali mentions in Mustafa, the idea that for maslaha to be mu'atabara, it has to be qat'i kulli, and it has to be daruri. Now, it doesn't seem to me, you can make the argument that it's kulli, that it's, it's for the collective interest, but it's very difficult to make the argument that this is qat'i. That in other words, if we don't support the gay rights movement on uh, homosexual marriage, that we will be in danger of, for example, death or one of the darurat al-khams, that there's going to be an impending genocide that will take place. This is where I think the whole thing, if we want to make an usuli argument, will literally flat, fall flat on its face. And I, I, I find it difficult to make an argument after that. Because my question then would be, if you can't prove it's qatai, that there's an imminent threat to one of the, for example, Darat al-Khams, one of the five uh, essential things that the Sharia came to protect, then on what usuli gr grounds um, is this argument being made? So I, I, want, I want to be very, very clear. Like, I don't even consider this to be, an, this mm. is not an usuli argument. Okay. This is not a fiqhi, this is not a, a fiqhi argument. This is a political argument. I mean, so I, I agree, by the way, I think Shadi makes a really good point, which is that it, and, and you've also said this, right? Which is that you can't really separate politics and morality, right? I, I, I completely agree. And, and this is, I mean, the irony about this is like, I, of all the positions I've taken in my life, this is the position to which I'm least attached. Right? I mean, I have yeah. zero Hashem in front and I had the Yamu Soth, and I had the Sabah Mushkira, I was shook. Are you talking about your article there, Hadi Yamu Soth? He came in like playing some stereo. Yeah, so, um, as if you had Hashem, but I had the Anna Aun Mukabila. It's so bad when I feel guilty when I don't. The, um, the, so this is like, I don't have a, um, like some atta strong attachment to this position. I, I could well be wrong, right? This is about what is like the, what is the decision that is best going to promote um, yeah. Muslims and our ability to be Muslim in the society? That's what I'm concerned with. Right? I'll get your point. I'll get your point. Um, so so yeah. here's the, here's, here's, here's the issue, right? Um, I don't, I've never advocated for gay marriage, right? I've advocated for, uh, the change of law that says that uh, I've advocated that it is not right that the U S government says that marriage can only be between a man and a woman. That's the only thing, right? So I, if I, that's what I want. That's what I thought Muslims should support. Muslims should support the minimal restrictions of what marriage means in our country legally, you know, according to our government. You, you know what your, your maneuver would have been better if, if you had, 
not given a specific and went back he's speaking to, to he's speaking to Jack. Yeah. Yeah. It would if you had not entered into a specific and just backtracked and said I believe that the US government should not determine certain moral moral should not enter and define certain moral matters. Right? Okay, yeah, I agree with you. Fine, that's a good point, Shadi. But then I have a question. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's say that's what you let's say that's what we've decided we're going to try and push for. Mm-hmm. And now somebody comes and says, "Okay, do you support this which side of the Obergfell case are you going to come down on? The one that says marriage has to be between it can only be between man and woman, or the one that says that marriage doesn't necessarily have to be between man and woman? If, if that's our objective, as we've as you've suggested, I'm not saying that's your opinion, but the, your your strategy that you're proposing for me, right? Um, that would necessitate us taking the quote unquote gay marriage side in the Obergfell decision, right? So that was actually precisely what, what I was arguing. That? What about not not taking your own side? Um, because I mean, that that may um, that might be a good position, right? But I think that that doesn't really reflect the real the social reality in our country and probably in Britain too, which is that people want to know what your opinion is. Like you can't yeah, we don't tell have Muslim to, kids. It's my opinion not to have an opinion. No, also- no, but I mean, you can't tell Muslim kids in high school who are getting asked this question by their friends. You know that you got to give them an answer. You have to give them. You have to equip them to answer these questions. That's really what I was yeah, trying to do: is to help. How do how do you equip young Muslims with a way to think about this issue publicly? But you know that sometimes arriving at uh, silence on a matter is a thought out uh, process, and that's the result: is that I literally cannot choose one or the other. Like you cannot choose either one. For example, the left and the right. Okay in America and probably England, the same thing worldwide, right? Na- the, the nativist cultures in Europe versus the, uh, the leftist. Uh, the, 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 I think the most accurate position is that you cannot take a position. That's a judgment that I've went through it and you cannot choose a side because both sides have something that we would stand for and both sides have, mutu- have uh, non-starters uh, that we cannot ever side with, right? So it is a sort of result it results in we have to form our own platform of things, right, on things. So our platform is going to be very unique. We're dead against uh, racism on one side, right? We're very much for um, racial, racial diversity, equal distribution of wealth. Sounds like all these, like, left-wing uh, things, right? But at the same time, we're, we're not – we don't support tax, taxation without, you know, uh, due cause because in Sharia that's an issue. We don't support homosexuality. So it's not only we don't support it, we're against it, right? So our platform is going to become a merger that nobody recognizes, right? And that's why that's really the best thing to teach our youth is that we have a platform that's neither left nor right. And you can I never- I agree with you. It, I, right? I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And I've actually, not to promote my own work, but like, you know, I've written about this on Yaqeen on yeah. issues of toxic masculinity and things like that. So I agree, like the prophetic model is not a right model or a left model, right? It's a prophetic model. Yeah. And we should, you know, considering the deadlock and state of non-functionality that American politics and society is in right now, and probably British too, right? Like people need answers and we should provide yeah. an answer, which is that we have this prophetic model. And just because you support the idea that the government should not define certain things does not necessarily mean that you have supported all the secondary consequences to that. Right. So it may, you may argue the wisdom, but if I say, listen, government, uncle Sam, I don't want you telling us, you know, uh, what marriage is. Well, that's true. He is, he can't, I'm basically saying uncle Sam don't make Tashiria. So that's actually a valid position, right? Uh, the secondary consequences of that may be, you know, certain things that are halal, certain things that are crazy. Right, haram. But I haven't necessarily, I'm not guilty of supporting those haram things. Right. Mm. So the question may be is it wise or is it not? Is the current status closer to the Sharia or is, are those secondary consequences positive and negative closer to the yeah. Sharia? So then you do a Muslim Hamaf sort of kind of analysis there. Exactly. Well, actually, uh, let me, let me, I want to say something because, you know, to be honest, like in the years since that article was written, the way things have changed, have developed, I, honestly, I, I've become much closer to Shadi's position. I, and I'll, I'll tell you why, right? It, it's not actually, it's because of how, okay, let me, let me start again, right? So since 
let's say the beginning of the Trump presidency, right? Yeah. There were two, there were two options, right? So th there was this, the, the kind of democratic party, the left, so to speak, right? Especially the progressive left, left embraced Muslims. So there were two possibilities, right? One is that, and this was always the danger that nobody agreed with, right? Or that I know of, right? Which was that Muslims would buy the progressive argument hook, line and sinker, drink the whole bottle of Kool-Aid, right? Mm. Um, that was what we were always afraid of, right? That Islam would just become an identity. You know, you have the, the like, the, the, the Latino person, the LGBT person, and the Muslim person. These are just all these different equivalent, minor, you know, minority groups um, who all agree with this, who are all the same, sort, same moral vision. This was the danger, right? Um, so then you'd have Muslims... Uh, celebrating things they can't celebrate in their religion, right? Uh, doing things like dancing in gay pride parades. Muslims shouldn't dance in gay pride parades. You can't celebrate these kind of actions. You can, if you want, you can say, I support certain rights. I want certain, the law to be a certain way, right? To protect people's rights. But I'm not going to actually support a certain lifestyle that I don't agree with. The, the problem is that all the, the most prominent Muslims involved in the kind of left-wing social justice al uh, alliance have completely gone, they've, they've, they've drunk in the Kool-Aid completely. And then they, they've, they've engaged in expressions that uh, really compromise their positions as Muslims and make it impossible for me as a Muslim to come out and support what they've done. Now, I will not, I'm not going to gang up on those people, right? You know, if I see these, someone like, you know, Ilhan Omar, Congressman Ilhan, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, this woman gets so many death threats from right-wing lunatics. She has her own security detail provided her by Congress, okay? So this, this, is a, this is a fellow, my Muslim sister, I will, not, I will not gang up on her and engage in some kind of public trashing of this person to, to increase the burden on her shoulders. But I do not agree with some of the things she said and done. And the, in doing those things and in advocating those things, she's made it effectively impossible for me as a Muslim, I think, to support her program. It's a very difficult position. It makes me very sad that this is the course that's happened over the last two to three years. I didn't, I hoped it wouldn't happen, but I, unfortunately, I think that's the path we've been going down, which as I said before, is a path that is making the Rakio position almost impossible to advocate for as it's, it's just, it's not a realistic possibility right now. So and just to is, summarize, sorry, just um, before she gets involved, I just wanted to kind of summarize what I've understood from, from both of you. Um, obviously, I think that about two years ago when this article was um, was first published until now, you're saying that there's been changes which have made it kind of impossible, very impractical at least, to, to advocate such a position and that from the Islam perspective, Masalah wouldn't be uh, as maybe you, you calculated them to be at that time. Um, you also admitted really that this is not an Islamic argument. You weren't using the language of usul and fiqh and all of these things. It was more of a political argument. So, so you could put it another way that this, this ratio approach has got nothing to do with Islam in a sense. And if that's- Yeah, I, I actually, I actually, I mean, I, uh, yeah, in effect, yeah. I would, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't say it's nothing to do with Islam because I'm Muslim and I wouldn't be thinking about this stuff if I weren't Muslim. Yeah, I don't know. I, no, but, I, but I mean, it's not, fighting. I'm not making some like Usuli argument. Definitely not. Yeah. So it's not a fatwa or something like this or ishtihad, uh, or- I mean- I'm sorry, like, are, what are Muslims like smoking some kind of weird drug or something? Like, when did this say as like, this is a fatwa? I mean, this is a, like, this is, are, are Muslims so immensely unsophisticated that they can't actually talk about political issues? They can the only talk about fatwas? Yeah, yeah, you know, when you put something on yaqeen, the, the issue is, 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 is more got like an apologetic remit, right? So obviously, if it's got an apologetic remit, people are thinking that what you're going to be talking about or writing about is in line or at least um, through the prism of the religious discourse. So I see what you're saying. I, you know, it's not something which is Islamic. It's something which you didn't intend um, to be like in a fatwa sense. And it's got nothing to do with Islam. But then one could question the fact that why is it on Yaqeen then? Because Yaqeen is more uh, an apologetic remit. It's, it's more of a academic... No, no, no. That, that, that's, I mean, look, uh, I, I understand yeah. that, that, you know, that's your view and some people might view that. But that's actually... Not one of the things we were trying to do with this mm. point counterpoint between Dr. Shadi and I was actually to try and provide some guidance and structuring the discussion around this issue. Uh, okay. So not in an apologetic sense. Like, 
I mean, let me, let me, I mean, I, I, again, I'm not criticizing what you said, but like if, if we're trying to promote some like wishy-washy liberal brand of Islam, why would we invite Dr. Shadi to give the counterpoint? <laughs> they would just have my article and then be like, Dr. Shadi's an idiot. He can't write stuff here. You know, so you don't, you don't invite someone who gives an argument that you know is a really good argument. Look, Dr. Shadi's argument is an excellent argument. It's an excellent argument. I said to this, to him at the time, <laughs> this is my what, 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 what could someone could come back and say is that, look, what well, actually what's, what's going on is that you're making it seem as if there's a religious debate but where there's no religious debate, according to your own admission. Well, what, what you're right. It's not a religious it debate. It's a political yeah. debate. It's a political well, debate. What it, what it was is, and academics do this, and maybe some uh, people aren't, uh, aren't really aware, but academics conduct uh, war games, right? Like, what if we said this, right? Uh, then what would the response? I viewed it as a type of that, like it, that uh, that your position was sort of a what if, what, what if we did this, what if that uh, uh, were the case, it, sort of yeah. exploring an option, right? And then my my job was to come in and and be, you know, like they, when they hire a retired general, come and you're the opponent, right? And let's just see if this strategy is going to work in a war game, yeah. right? And so that that was my job to poke all the holes in it. Uh, so what I, that's how I felt that it was. It's rather than, a, you know, a hard and fast uh, program that he's going to be doing speaking tours on it. So that's how I viewed it was. Just like I'm really interested in the, uh, the soft liberal type of war game where we say, what if it was promoted in a society that every grouping, and I actually believe this is, you know, probably better for us. You you're, you're, forget citizenship of where you're born. It's what is your law, right? What is your law? That's a more accurate way to categorize people than what land you were born in. And then based upon what your law is, that's how you'll be judged and interact, right? Mm. Okay. And so I, I could say I'm Muslim. Someone else could say I'm a progressive liberal. Someone is someone. And then when I, when I go to court with a Muslim, I'm going to go to court, right, in that court. And then, but we'd have to extrapolate that because it's going to lead to a whole bunch of different clashes. But that's what, there's a guy in England, an LSC, what was his name, John? Jack, what was his name, that guy? He put forth this idea that it's, it's, this is the super soft liberalism. Right? Yeah, like, I know what you're talking classified about. Classified by their law. Uh, he, has, he has like a really... Um, He's like Europe, Eastern European. His name, yeah, his name is impossible for me to remember. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. He's an Eastern... Now, the U.S. has gone the exact... We're like fascist liberals right now. So it's... But, that, but it's, I think this is... I, and this is the point I was trying to make, which was that... If you go back to like 2016 until, and I, I want to stress this, we are going to see within the next few months, we're going to see a shoe drop and it's mm -hmm. either going to be in this place or it's going to be in that place. It's the St. James school case that has to do with the scope of the ministerial exemption, which I sent you guys readings on. Right. And if that scope is narrow, if it takes, if it takes a position of the ninth circuit court, the ability of Muslims and other religious communities to have their own bubbles of existence is going to be extremely limited. If that case comes down with an expansive, wide understanding of what the ministerial exemption is, then it's going to make it a lot more possible, nothing close to what Dr. Shadi is suggesting, but a lot closer to what he's suggesting than otherwise. So that's what I was hoping is we would go down a path more towards a soft liberal morally pluralistic, even legally pluralistic society, and not one in which a, either a kind of progressive hegemony or a Judeo-Christian Western European hegemony was going to be enforced on everybody in the country. In fact, what we have right now is a battle between these two things, neither of which are very welcoming to Muslims. Yeah. And uh, we should hope that Gorsuch maybe feels a little bit guilty and owes one to the right, right? That's, uh, that's what I, I was thinking, like, when that, when the Bostock, Bostock County uh, court decision came down, I was like, this is only going to work if the St. James school comes with a really expansive understanding of yeah. ministerial exemption. So you say no, no, uh, no uh, discrimination based on gender and sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. But the area in which you can have discrimination because of religious belief is going to be big. Yeah. But if they make that area small, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a disaster. And, but this also goes to show the, that there are some method, methodologies that can last longer than others. So a methodology where it says, listen, I'm just going to go by, you know, the letter of the law. I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, engage in some kind of a, you know, 
uh, political operation because the game, the game's changing constantly, right? Everything's constantly changing. And who you have to be with now is you may be, you know, it harms you later. So that's where the idea of where when I make the conclusion that I'm actually stepping back, okay, may actually end up having, you know, a long-term stability to that view because the game keeps changing, you know? And who knows that how Muslims in the future will not be viewed as, you know, these people of color that can be banded into, you yeah, know, the yeah. minority groups. We might actually be viewed as, eventually be viewed in with the opposite side or in, in our own hey, camp. My biggest, my biggest fear in this whole situation, and I'll be honest with you, is when I, especially when I go to North America and interact with young people, my biggest fear is that when I actually have conversations with them, um, what it seems to be, because you've got people like Ilhan Omar and others uh, like her, who go to the, grave, the, the gay pride parade and the dancing around with, with, with them. It's, it seems to me a lot of these young people have this assumption or belief that people like Ilhan Omar and others like them are getting their backing. They got the yeah. backing of people like Jonathan Brown because of articles like the ones he's written. Which, if you think about what he said today, obviously, what you've just said today, and wait, but hang, hang on. I want to say, I wrote in that article yeah. against why Muslims should not go in gay pride parades. I wrote in that article a year before she danced in the great gay pride parade. So yeah, in that but, article, said, no, no, but to be fair, what I remember you saying was that let me actually get exactly what you said. You can you can quote exactly what I say. Because yeah. I, I I gave precisely why Muslims should not you, I don't, go in fair, gay I don't pride think parade. Yeah, I don't think you said don't go to the gay pride parade, but you said I did. I hundred percent said it. Go, go, don't, don't, don't look at a piece of paper, man. Go pull this up the is, website, read the article. No, I've, I've written it word for word. Believe me, believe me. I've, I, I was looking very closely at what you said, and because what you said about it is that you, in basically something to do with, uh, they shouldn't Muslims shouldn't do something to affect us. Muslims should do something they're not comfortable with, but you didn't make it categorically clear that. Um, a Muslim should not go to gay pride parades. You said you, you, you nestled it in, you couched it. No, 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 no. no I, I'll be very clear. I said Muslims should not participate in gay pride parades. Go, go, go. I mean, okay, let, me, let me say something. To what's do some, going, you what know, I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to find the website. I'm going to read it to you. Guys. Okay, uh, while, you, while you're yeah. doing that, let me make a comment while Jack is finding it. That a lot of people on the internet, uh, people actually need to n n learn a tool of, of how to make a conclusion on the internet because a single quote let's say he did say that right well yeah. we have in in the quran yeah you have multiple nasus right and you have to bring all the nasus before you make a conclusion right yeah, but this is this is a 45 minute essay it's not like a 77000 words of the quran it's, it's, it's much more easy to make a conclusion no I'm, no but a person I'm not an individual that, I'm not that Jonathan Brown no, no, was it, that he should an go an to individual this. an individual makes multiple statements let's say right yeah in the course of a year two three four years on an issue makes multiple statements right so you have to couch one statement that may be ambiguous you have to also put it in in line with all the other statements right and yeah. see uh uh okay uh, i i have I, i'm gonna read it to you. i'm gonna read it to you guys first Please of all do, yeah. dr yeah. shaddy dr Sh shaddy's position is correct is, and one of the things i think we should be doing by the way i mean i'm not you know people like you uh muhammad hijab people like shaddy who really like have a podcast and stuff you guys need to raise the bar you guys need to pull muslims up None of this like nonsense. Of, I heard this. Somebody told me mm. that. Did you really say this? Look, it's okay, easy. Read, read, read go out, back to read the, out, go Jack. back to the. These are, I didn't write. I didn't write like a five hundred page book. This is like you know. Fine. No, but you have essay, written like right? nice. By the way, he's, uh, for those viewers who are watching, you've written a very good. I don't know how many page book it was, but it was about slavery, which I recently bought. Uh, it was a very good book. And, it's a doorstop. Yeah, mashallah. Okay, here, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read go it. Ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, I am frequently asked by Muslim student groups about how they should respond to invitations to participate in gay pride parades, which can be, let's just say, a little bit too edgy for Muslim sense of public propriety and modesty. Yeah. Yeah. My response, don't lapse into thinking that supporting someone's right is an all or nothing relationship. Let's imagine a comical Muslim rights parade or Muslims parade with burqas and long beards, angrily chanting and condemning physical contact between sexes outside of marriage, right. crying pork and alcohol. Would we expect our allies from the LGBT community and other groups to march with us? Of course not. They'd be understandably uncomfortable with some of these expressions of Muslimness, quote unquote. 
Similarly, Muslims can affirm their support for some, L well, I wrote here, for LGBT rights, but I would say some LGBT rights, right? Commit what themselves did you write? to What did you, was it some? No, no, I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote LGBT rights, but I made it very clear in the article that I don't support all of them, right? Um, oh. Commit themselves to being present at other rallies and in efforts to lobby lawmakers without participating in events that might be outside of Muslim countries. Okay, but you said they can commit themselves to go to the rallies. That's what you said. Yo, go go to a rally about discrimination. Like if there's if there's a rally, right, where someone says, you know, uh, we're being beaten up, or we're being abused by police, we're being called names in public okay, and insulted. I get what you're, yeah, you're I would go to that you're... rally, and I'd be like, no one should be called, treated like this for right. sure. But but Jack, right? You, you you just said here very. You said it. You said you read it yourself, right? You said that. You can go to the rally, but just don't do things which are X, Y, Z, right? No, 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 no. There's <laughs> gay pride parade is not a rally. Okay. Gay pride parade is a gay pride parade. A rally is a political rally. Yeah, but you can have a political rally that's premised on, on gay uh, LGBT rights, no? I, ha no? I have a, there's a problem that always comes up on this. And what? that problem is that there is a, a type of link where oftentimes normal human rights like don't, not getting beat up while walking in the street is oftentimes couched as an LGBT right. And there's a, sometimes a confusion there, right? Yeah, I get that. Okay. So, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm an outsider and I'm a, I'm a fan of Jonathan Brown. I've got nothing. You know, I love Jonathan Brown for the sake of a lot. I read his stuff and I share his stuff. And I rep, I've actually referenced you in one of my books as well. So thank you. This is not, this is not from a person who's a hater or someone who's going to catch you up. But I'm just being honesty. It's like the Muslims are all complementarily trying to achieve the same objective. What I'm saying is this, is that when, when, you've, when I read that myself, my question is, uh, my question to myself is, is he saying that you can go to the rally but not do certain acts in that rally? For example, maybe dancing or something like that. So in other words, it's not categorical enough by way of prohibition. Like in terms of if, if your view is that there should not be Muslims, young Muslims, go into rallies which are LGBT related and you don't want people to use your own material as, um, as, a, as a kind of backing for that or a, a way to try and legitimize that practice. That I believe that the, the phraseology in that, in, the, in that particular passage there was not decisive. I have to be honest. Okay, that, that's, you know what, I can, I'm happy to go and actually edit that and say, okay. and because I didn't, I didn't think that, I didn't think of rally and the pride parade as the same thing at all. Right. So I will, I'm, I will go and I will edit that and I will make it clearer. And in fact, I'll even put in some rights because I, I wrote that very clearly in other parts of the paper. But, but don't I you think it makes there. more sense? Cause you just said in this podcast that, I mean, um, you were being introspective and you said that you've kind of moved away from the whole ratio approach. It's something you don't really believe in anymore. And you've moved more towards Shadi's opinion to just take this whole thing down. Really. Wait, wait, hang on. I believe in the ratio approach. I don't believe it's been made. I believe it has been foreclosed on by developments in American politics and society. I, I, okay. I still believe in it. So what? But I don't believe do it's, I believe it is much less possible now than so it was. What, what, part, what part of it do you, because we've already established that you, this is not really an Islamic argument. You've accepted that the criticism is that, okay, this, a lot of this stuff could be used um, as a way of justifying people, you know, literally supporting things which might be prohibited in Islam. Don't you think- No, I haven't, I haven't accepted that because I don't think that's true. I think if somebody okay. looks at this article and thinks that somehow I'm trying to say that we should support uh, things that are haram in our religion, that that's just not accurate. I, I, I think that's not accurate at all. I don't think Okay, but the idea that you accepted also, uh, you've accepted that something like this article is not really meant, um, it's not trying to reason through the Islamic paradigm. It's not trying to reason to it. It is actually a liberal argument. It's a secular argument. Like, or like what Shadi said in his article, it says- Yeah, yeah, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'd say it's a true liberal argument. So why would you put that on a Muslim website? It's a tr I, I'm, I'm actually happy to own that. Like, yes, I'm making a soft liberal argument for minimal state invasion in telling people how to live. But that's not your. That's not. That's not who you are, though, Jennifer Brown. You're a person who usually argues through the Islamic paradigm. You're not a progressive Muslim. That's the, at least how I interpret. Well, like yeah, okay, but the, let's like I, I understand. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to. I have a tendency to get really angry, so I'm just like let's not. When I say 
that's a Don't soft angry liberal. Because... <laughs> no, I'm saying when I say that's a soft liberal argument, right? Yeah. What I mean is something that, exactly what Dr. Shadi was saying earlier, which is yeah. uh, in the West, and by the way, this is the state, the, the nature of the pre-modern state in general is it did not get involved in people's lives. The state basically provided law and order. They had an army to defend against invasions. And pretty much everything else was up to the up to civil society, right? Yeah. The modern state gets involved in everything, tells you what your kids are going to learn when they're kindergartners, tells you what color you can paint your house, uh, if you can have chickens in your backyard, et cetera, et cetera, right? So yeah. that's the modern state. It's, it's omnipresent and it's invasive. What I'm arguing for is a, a true, like, original, pure liberal idea of the government not getting involved in people's moral lives, right? That people, that a religious community has a right to live its own life and interact okay. with other communities in a society that is minimally invasive. But and like that's what that, that is, said, if you said that and not specified gay rights, or gay, sorry, gay marriage, which you, you explicitly specified Muslims should support gay marriage under U.S. law. I said the right to gay marriage. Yeah, okay. Same Big thing. difference. Big, eh, 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 not the same thing. Big okay. difference. Okay, I agree. Uh, Big let's, difference. Let's somebody take, comes let's and says, that. do you support gay marriage? I'll say, no, I don't. I don't believe this is pleasing to God. Yeah. What is he, do, you believe in an, uh, do you believe in a law that defines marriage as something in which gay people have a right to marry? Because we all, we're not going to define marriage between man and woman? I'd say, yes, of course I support that. So you, you, you basically, what you're saying then is, you're saying that you don't believe that the, the government should decide on the form of the marriage, what it should look like, or how it should be defined. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, see, you, see, you see this. Yeah, if you said that, there would be no controversy. But I, I genuinely believe if you said this, if you said it the way you just said it now, which, which I'm very happy with and I don't have any problem. But if you had that, there would be no controversy. But unfortunately, because of the, the possibility of misrepresentation here, and... The, 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 the fact that some people could be using what you're saying to say, well, as Muslims, we're allowed to uh, support gay marriage or get the right to gay marriage, which uh, for vernacular ears, for people in the, in, in, in the lay audiences, they're not going to really see the differences in that. It kind of rescues the spiritual disaster that could be, right? People thinking that people actually not knowing the dividing line between what's halal and haram. That's the, I, I believe that's the biggest problem that can come out of this. Like I said, when I was speaking to people in North, North America, many young people were concerned, I have to say. They were saying, this is what's happening with Ilhan Amar. This is what's happening with this Linda Sassour. And Yaqeen is staying quiet. Uh, or not, sorry, Yaqeen, but people like Jordan uh, Brown. Uh, Jonathan Brown, sorry. Jack is staying quiet on the issue. And in fact, it seems like he's giving them the ammunition, you see. Now, obviously, we would come back and say, no, it's not really as you think it is. And you didn't mean it like this. And we, we do host of done and we try and argue your case. But if, if, you, if you have things like Muslims should support um, the right for gay marriage and you're explicit, very clear, then I think that it, there can be that uh, tashwish, yeah, that can be that uh, confusion in the, in the minds of young people. Yeah, look, I mean, yeah. uh, sorry, Sh I know I, I want to give Shadi a chance to talk, so I'm, I'm going to say this and I'll let Sh Shadi mm -hmm. talk, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, I, I think there's a, like I've talked to people like advisors of Ilhan Omar about this issue, about number of issues that have come up. And I've, exp okay. I've expressed my, I've explained my concerns in, yeah. in the, the years since this article was published. Right. But as I said before, I, I don't think I, I'm not going to do this kind of public lambasting of, of her of, or uh, of yeah, another yeah. Muslim sister. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not asking you to lambast. Yeah. So, and I have actually, I have written about this stuff on my Facebook. Uh, I've said explicitly, for, I sent you these things, for example, like on the, 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 on the masterpiece gate cake case or the Asher wedding cake case in the UK, I said the UK Supreme Court was completely correct. It was, it is definitely the right of the baker not to be forced to make a cake that uh, forces yeah. the, the, the baker to engage in expression he doesn't agree with. So I totally side with the baker on this, right? I've explicitly talked about issues of things like trans uh, education in yeah. for, for young children, things like the Birmingham school issue yeah. Yeah. Uh, where I said children should not be exposed to this kind of issue at that young age. Um, so I've, I've actually come out a, a lot and talked about these yeah. issues. Yeah, I yeah. haven't written a, a Yaqeen article about it. Um, yeah. 
and to be honest that that's really more of like a personal choice of mine right. um i don't want to get into i don't, yeah. don't want to feel comfortable getting into the, the details of why i haven't done that but uh i have done my best on my social media to weigh in on those things because i think they are very very important in fact yeah. they are yeah. much more important than the obergfeld decision for yeah. muslims i mean i think and this is some of the stuff I, I, I was sending you material on. Yeah. Stuff about what kids are taught in school, uh, what rights parents have to opt out of certain classes. Uh, this yeah. is really, really, really a thousand times more important because it, it get, when you talked about you can't se separate politics and morality, the, the collision of those two is in education, especially early childhood education. Yeah. Mm. My, uh, so I understand that. Shadi, what would you want to add to that? Well, you agree wanna, with me maybe that... that uh, the article that was initially wrote, uh, written by Jack is, uh, and I don't know why, until this day why, why, why they call you Jack, um, it was potentially something which can cause confusion. And would you be uh, at least for maybe a complete re-editing of that essay? Yeah, I mean, I, I would... Uh, uh... I mean, if they want to re-edit it, it's up to them what to do, what to write, and what's up to date and what's not up to date. But the rebuttal, the fact that they put the rebuttal is, you know, that's also, you know, something to be considered. And when people are going off on the internet and youth and re people reading, I just want to keep it, just give people one point, is that when you look at a statement from an author, uh, the right way to make an analysis is to look at all the state authors of that uh, statements of that author on yes. a particular point, right? Whether it be Jamal Jam Adilla. Yeah, Jamal Adilla. And sometimes what I see is going on is a little bit of unfairness, uh, not necessarily just to, to John and Brown, but uh, because as obviously I wrote, the, I wrote a rebuttal on it. So that's my perspective on that line or that point. But to a lot of people, one line is taken, one image, one picture. Yes. And we have a saying either if there is a possibility that that picture does not represent 100% and it could be explained away, then I can't make a conclusion. So likewise, I, I look at a lot of people whose a quote was taken from here, 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 three or four, but five and seven and eight and nine of the complete, you know, opposite conclusion quotes yes, yes. Yeah, were not yeah. taken. And to me... This is nothing less than slander in a sense. It's, it's an intellectual version of slander where I would just take that quote and ignore that evidence, right? Yeah, yeah. And if we did that in fiqh, we, we'd laugh, right? If someone eats in Ramadan and says, well, Allah says, Kulu wa shrabu, eat and drink. Allah said it, <laughs> right? Allah said it. But hold on a second. He also said uh, fast Ramadan. No, I, I, do, I, I do agree there has been, there has been some uh, misquote mining and all these kinds of things, especially with Dr. Brown and... And, and I want to stress the fact that I believe, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't read too many of your um, books, but because I've <clears throat> actually read a lot of the articles of Dr. Jonathan Brown, um, some of the books and seen some of the work that he's done. I mean, this is not to take away from any work that we're just having a conversation here about some of the controversies that potentially constitute the weakest link of your portfolio of work that potentially yeah. needs to be readjusted. And uh, it's not about... Um, you know anything else it's, it's, we, we want to promote uh, goodness and we want to promote we, as we do I've, as, I, as i said before i've referenced and, and uh, uh, continuously actually led people to some of your your work um it's it's not it might sound like it's a deep criticism it's definitely not that and we're not coming from a point of trying to label or cancel or anything like that it's not it's not from this perspective i mean i would say i would say this i, I mean i don't I think that article, I mean, it's funny that people are still talking about it, as I said before, because I think it's so out of date. I mean, yeah. it's not it, it, the situation, the, 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 the waqa'a, the reality has changed so much since that article mm -hmm. that it's, it's sort of a pointless article to read now. Um, so I, what I would say, without a doubt, is, and I've been arguing, you know, we've been discussing this yaqeen for a while, is yeah. we, we need to write a kind of part two about this issue now, because we in the Muslim community are in a very different situation. I think one of the reasons we haven't done it is because this St. James school case is such a big right. deal. I think when that case comes down, I think at that point, it's going to be really time to, if you're going to get involved in a discussion, which we did, right? If you're going to get involved in the discussion, you got to follow up, right? And I think at that point, 
we're going to have to write something to address a lot of these issues. And also, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to make the point that when we're in a jama'a, as we are, as colleagues, people in Dawa, people who are concerned about the matter, it's yeah. actually being in touch with the jama'a uh, has yes. benefits like this. It allows Absolutely. for, Absolutely. maybe if I had a slip up or I said a word that didn't work out, yeah. Um, but being in the Jama'ah, and this happened to me recently, right? Like I made a statement that wasn't 100% accurate, you know, uh, in a month uh, definition. But had I cut myself off, number one, uh, I wouldn't have had the benefit of being shown that there was an yeah. error. Likewise, if somebody had when attacked me so viciously and emotionally, I would myself not want to engage with anyone. So therefore, I'll never be corrected. So there's two opposites. There's the one person who is arrogant, who doesn't want to be part of the group. Then there's like the rabid um, attacks on people rather than having a discussion. And, and how do we know the difference, right? You know the difference by someone's track record. Someone has a track record that pretty much they want to be part of Ahl Sunnah and they want to do the right thing and they want to reach the right conclusion. That yeah. person, when, if they make a statement that I totally disagree with, they deserve, they've earned the right of you know, decent interaction. Maybe can you explain? Can we discuss this a little bit more? Very different, much different than someone with a, a complete, uh, completely insane view who has a track record of other insane views. At that point, then yeah, you can bash him all you want and trash him and, and ignore him because that he's proven himself that that's what he wants. So there's, in, in our dialogue, I think these, these points are important to realize yes. that if you go on that attack, you actually disallow that person from ever reviewing his work right mm. and getting to the goal that you want which is for them to see your perspective so it's all about these uh, manners of ikhtilaf to actually arrive us at the conclusion that we want to i wanted to ask uh, dr brown one more uh, question that was probably um uh, as controversial if not probably a little bit less controversial it was to do with um an article written about salvation for non-muslims now i'll be honest i read the entire article and i made sure to read it more than once as well. I didn't see anything in that article that says that you have the perennialist uh, view or anything like that, that kind of view or the view that all uh, paths lead to the same truth or anything like that. But then when I did a bit more digging, I came across a part of the uh, essay which was uh, removed. And this is what it says. It says, to be clear, what follows here is just my idea. Um, it thus also seems possible that God could forgive the sin of shirk for a reason other than repentance, perhaps as an expression of his immeasurable mercy. Um, this was subsequently removed from the article. Someone would argue then, why, why didn't you clarify that this was removed and, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, make the correction public? Uh, well, I mean, I actually can't remember what my argument for I can't remember what argument I had for what I said. Like, I mean, mm. I mean that, that, that's not the question you asked, but I'm actually trying to remember like what ev evidence I had for that. I can't, I honestly can't remember it. Um, yeah. But I assume I had some decent, you know, some reason I thought yeah. it was worthwhile. Um, and actually, so this is a great example of exactly what Shadi's just talking about. So I wrote that article. Yes. And Mobin Vade, for whom I have great respect, wrote a public critique very very forceful serious but extremely polite yeah. and and respectful you know so something that you couldn't you you couldn't hold it against him right you had to look at what he was saying you had to take shadi also talked to me and uh and i i took i took that part and there was another part i took out as well very small okay. thing um you know why didn't i make it why didn't we make it public? I can't remember. Honestly, I, I can't remember if we did make it public or not. Like, so I why was it there me. in the first place then? What, what did you intend by that meaning that then you removed? So yeah. I went back and I, I looked at the article right now and there, it doesn't mention that it was changed. And actually, this is something we've discussed. We've actually agreed upon it, Yakin, that we're going to, like when there's a change made to an article, you know, a significant change, not like, you know, somebody added something in a footnote, but when some, a change is made to the article, that we're just going to say, this article has been updated, but um, I mean, I, so I honestly, I can't remember like what we did or didn't do in terms of noting any change to that article when it came out. But I mean, I would just say right now, like what, I mean, um, 
yeah, we, we took those two sections out, those two sentences out, and that was it. I mean, I'm not sure what critics would prefer. Would they prefer that we have something at the bottom that says what I originally said so that somebody can get misled by them? I mean, the whole, the whole, the whole idea is that you remove these because they're confusing to people. Right. So the idea that you would sort of like remove them and then include them in some kind the, of the, like the only issue would be that if someone had read it before and not seen the correction that they can have the same impression that you know that they've already seen that you know I mean but then I mean that would mean that we'd have to have some kind of method of alerting anybody who had read the article with some kind of like ping yeah. that a change had been made and that just you know that did, that, that that doesn't happen I mean uh so to be honest, I think, look, I'm going to tell you what I think really this is about, right? This is about people want me to engage in some kind of like self-flagellation. They want to like put me on a donkey and parade me around town, you know, uh, do like tashir. They want to do like tashir of me. Mm-hmm. And like, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not going to, you know, look, I, 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 I 100% accept criticism. I accept criticism when it's, done with incredible adab and propriety like people like dr shadi i accept criticism when it's done by complete a-holes okay if those, if, if someone's a it's a, a, a like a jerk slanderous, <laughs> no i mean if someone's like a slanderous bloated jerk and they uh they write something you know dr brown spelled this word wrong that's a good point you know Right. So if if someone makes a point and like you, you made a point two plus two is not five. I got to change that. doesn't matter if the guy's nice or not. So I'm happy to take criticism. We are very happy to take criticism. Very happy to take criticism. I'm sure. Uh, But but this idea of like, why, why didn't you like come out and draw attention to the mistakes you made in the article? Because the whole point is not to draw attention to the mistakes because the mistakes are misleading. Okay, that's the, 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 the issue of that article. Um, and by the way, those criticisms were made, I mean, within, I'm just going to say like within days of when the article came out, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and so the other question you asked me about was the issue of insulting the Prophet, Lay Salaam. Yeah, I wanted to ask right? you about that. I wanted to ask you about insulting. Yeah. In fact, I just, I, 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 that's fresh in my mind because some genius just like brought this up to me yesterday. Like he's like the first person who brought this criticism to my attention. I was like, oh, thanks a lot, man. Like I, I didn't, where I was like, have you been in a coma for three months or something? <laughs> Four months? You when know? did this take place? When did you make your comments? I think it was the end of January. I was in the UK. I was in um, High Wickham. Oh, yes, yes. High yes. Wickham. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, and I, I wrote about this so much online. I said, uh, I, I really regret my choice of words. I shouldn't have, I, I regret my choice of words. I regret, I, and I, a tube of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he the kert is in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, be, 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 slubin la, uh, la, 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 yan bighi li, li man lahu had al maqam al mahmud, right? So, um, I have no problem uh, admitting my error, right? Uh, in the yeah. way I talk, I, I would, if I had gone back, I would have said, I would have used very different words. I do still take the same position, right? Um, so let me just be clear. I, I, I regret, what position is that? You don't want to talk about yourself. No, no, the same no, 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 no. I mean, I'm going to explain, right? So I yeah, regret yeah. the the way I phrased it. Right? Yeah. Two. I do not want anybody to insult the Prophet. Yeah. And in a Muslim society or in a Muslim country, I actually think it should be illegal to insult the Prophet. Right? And by the way, in societies where they already have strict hate speech laws or anti-defamation laws or laws about public order and incitement against strife, places like Singapore, even some place like France, I think that those laws should be enforced equally and that people should not be allowed to insult the person. So something like Charlie Hebdo should not have been allowed to have those cartoons because Charlie Hebdo is not allowed to have cartoons that, for example, have anti-Semitic uh, or anti-Jewish uh, uh, sentiment in them, right? So I, I think if you're going to have a law that says you can't insult 
uh, you can't cause communal hatred, you can't insult religious figures, that should be applied across the board and it should not be allowed to insult the prophet, whether it's the West or not the West, right? But in societies like the United States, where you don't have hate speech laws, so there are no laws of, there are no laws against hate speech in the United States, as far as I know. It's certainly not at the federal level, right? Uh, I do not think that Muslims should advocate laws that restrict speech because it's considered hateful or restrict speech because it insults figures who are venerated because the first people who will be restricted in their speech because of that will be Muslims. The Quran, yeah. And, and yeah, I, I, and you've seen, we saw this in the UK. Go back and look at the, all the articles about the Trojan horse issue, right? Look at the, what the Ofsted reporters said, not in their written report, but in their oral, the oral discussions. They mentioned how they went into the library of one of these schools and it was quote unquote filled with hate speech, with hate literature. What was it filled with? The Quran, right? So if you believe, and you can see this oddly enough in Muslim countries, countries like Indonesia, countries like Egypt, right? Where they have this thing now where you can't call someone who's not Muslim a kafir because it caused like, imagine how, how are Muslims supposed to talk about their religion or teach their children their religion if basic things in the Quran, like criticisms of another religious tradition, criticism of another religious uh, beliefs, calling someone who's not Muslim a kafir, if you can't do that, our, the Quran itself becomes an article of hate speech. So if, by the way, freedom of speech laws or, or, or hate speech laws are never used to protect, my, to protect vulnerable minorities like Muslims. They're used to protect the powerful when minorities get out of line. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I think th this would become problematic if you phrased it. I'm not saying you, I mean, obviously you've recanted what you've said, but if you phrased it in a way which is like, I support the, the right for, you know, um, a person to insult the prophet. No, well, well, I, I see this as a, being the exact same thing. It's where the same thing as the gay marriage no, thing, isn't it? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're supporting, or you're supporting the idea but, that but here, the government I, I think no longer... That I the government doesn't severe. engage in uh, judging. I think it's more severe because uh, with the whole, uh, from what I understood from Dr. Brown's argument with the gay speech, uh, the gay marriage one, is that he doesn't think that gay marriage has any place in the Sharia. Like it's, it's a non-factor from that perspective. Like gay marriage is, is just, a, it's nothing. It, it doesn't exist. It has no Sharia um, placement. Whereas with this Seb bin Nabi, even if it's being done, or which is uh, being important to the Prophet even if it's being done to someone who is not a Muslim, there's clear Sharia guidelines on the kind of uh, at least attitude that we should have to those people. So it would be very, I think it would send the wrong message. If you say, well, I, I you know, um, I support, if you put it in this phraseology, I support the right for someone to insult the Prophet Muhammad. That phraseology is extremely, I'm not saying you would endorse that phraseology, but technically based on the usul you put in place, that statement wouldn't be barton. That statement wouldn't be dis disagreeable to the usul you've put in place. But I think that you can... No, no, I, I think it would. I mean, both, Go whether on. it's whether it's Liwat or Sub and Nebi, yeah. these things are haram. Yeah. yeah. Religiously haram, right. right? And so if you, if, you had, if you had a Muslim government, like a Muslim state, right? Uh, Liwat would be haram and Sub and Nebi would be haram. They'd be both illegal, right? If you did Liwat, you could be taken to court. And if you did Sub and Nebi, you could be taken to court. Right, whether you're a Muslim or non-Muslim, um, so uh, I think that there, there, I don't, I, I don't see a lot of difference between them in the kind of from the Sharia perspective. I, I, I think that there is a similarity that Dr. Shai is bringing up, which is that um, it's it's looking at how do Muslims thrive and function in a society in which they are a vulnerable minority, right? So uh, that's why I, I mean. I think that it's, it's my, I mean, for example, there's, we talked about this before, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in the United States who want to, who essentially want to make having Muslim beliefs illegal, right? And you don't, I don't want to give the government any power to make that happen by giving the government power to restrict speech, to restrict belief, right? Um, so that's why I, I don't I don't believe in laws that restrict 
yeah. uh, hate speech. So basically, what you're saying is that you you want the government to stop legislating matters and become more soft of a, a take a soft liberalist approach, because we'd be able to breathe too. Uh, yeah, so that's really that's what I think. I, I know what you're saying. Okay, I, get, I I kind of get this now. But what what I would like to put in, put forward um, submit to you guys today is, I think you make it very. If that's the position you're taking, I understand it. There's two things I would, I would want to suggest, and I don't know what you think of these recommendations, yeah? Uh, recommendation number one, if one believes that there should be like more of a libertarian approach in terms of government intervention, social matters, um, relating, for example, to marriage, divorce, um, to religion, to morality, etc. If that's the stance, uh, then I would stop there. Like, yeah, in, in the sense that I wouldn't build upon it and say so therefore i support the right of x person gay person to get married on the u.s law or that i support the right of a person to insult the prophet um, muhammad etc et because that secondary aspect is where the shubha can come in i believe the shubha can come in it really can it really really can and people can really confuse your statement which you're building upon different usul yeah, which now we understand, but they can really, really understand it as this person has capitulated to Western narratives and is bending over backwards to try and please those individuals. A secondary thing I would want to recommend is, I think there's a big difference in saying this would be better for the Muslims, Yeah, in, in the sense that it would be better for a Muslim minority aqaliya in a Muslim land, for such law to be in place instead of X law, instead of Y law. So it's better. It's, or it's, it's less of an evil, for example, it's the lesser of two evils. To make that very clear and to use that language, it's the lesser of two evils for this law to be in place but, uh, than this law, then to say uh, this is what I believe should, the law should be this, as if this is the Aslan, the utopian um, kind of consideration that this is what we want the law to be. Because for us, the utopian thing is obviously ma qalahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Rasulullah. So, so I think those two things, if they're made very clear, because I understand, Dr. Brown, now, I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, I understand how you've built your argument. But if you package it in that way, say, look, I'm not advocating that these laws are the best laws. I'm just saying these are the lesser of two evils. It's better for the Muslim community. I'm not in support of anyone insulting the Prophet. I'm not in support of this and that. It makes your position, while the hajid them very clear that it, it's almost impossible for it to be attacked in that sense, unless you're going to get some or people from the you know the fringes attacking it but from that angle you're firmly within the prism you're firmly within the paradigm you don't need to come out of the paradigm or become a liberal or to you know, to write in liberal terms and to, to, to leave your soul I think if you do that then khalas, you, you've kind of cleaned it all up you've mopped it all up what, 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 do, you, what do you guys think of this? And, and let me add something else too. If you pro, if you put forth the libertarian view as the khafid dararain, the yeah. lesser of two evils, uh, you can only be attacked on one as one side, which we can close that attack. And that attack would be someone saying, "Well, you're opening the door to X, Y, Z horrible things also being said, right?" But you you would close the door by saying that's a vanni that's possible to happen. What's guaranteed to happen is that Muslims will have their right to do their to worship there uh, properly or worship as they see fit. So that's guaranteed, and the guaranteed matter, you know, will take precedent and is heavier than the possibility. Because if you say government, do not talk about any speech, do not ban any books, Uncle Sam, don't make tashriya and don't get involved, right? So, yeah, that means we can write all, we can have yeah. our Quran and write all our books. The, the thing, yeah, sorry. And, and, and someone say, yeah, but that also allows for people to curse the Prophet We're saying yeah. we're against that, but that's a vanni, that's maybe. And what's certain is that by this, we guarantee our right to, to practice our deen. So that's just an argument. Yeah. Well, the Akhafa Dorain thing is, it's very, it's in the name. It's like the lesser of two evils, right? Yeah, they're both, they're both evil. The, well, the ratio thing is, that is, is, there's not two options. There's the opt-out option. There's the rejection. Uh, you, you mentioned it with like four or five or three yeah. options. So it, wouldn't, it would be difficult to make a lesser of two evils argument with the ratio thing. But I think that uh, with this situation where you're talking about, generally speaking about laws which don't infringe, would you rather have laws that do infringe and they will infringe the Muslim right? 
Or would you rather have laws which do infringe, uh, don't infringe, and then Muslims will be more protected in terms of ibadat and etc. etc. Yeah. But I think that initial initial framework, if you lay it out like that, then yeah. it's very easy for someone to follow with you. Say, okay, I understand what. You yeah, know, which there's no shubha there. Yeah, which is why in usul al fiqh, uh, I was taught early on in usul al fiqh, they actually tend to like to give outlandish examples, uh, just so that you don't get bogged down in a specific yeah. example. And what happened with this, uh, we, you know, what Jack was saying is that I think because the example was a, a real thing that's happening right now, like gay marriage or Seb and everyone's eye, uh, attention went to that example. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Yeah. And I think if, so could we agree then in terms of, cause obviously what we're trying to do is in a sense, we're trying to make um, everything clear for the people. I'm not here to try and you guys, mashallah, both of you are senior to me in every single way. I'm just giving you my feedback from the, from the lay, from the ground, from, from, from what I genuinely fear yeah, is because I've had a lot of these engagements with young people, especially because my demographic is from like 18 to 35. There can be confusion. Yeah. So it's, it's forget about what the letter of like, we're not literalists in that sense that, you know, the, exactly what he said and if the word is there. It can be construed in certain ways. Can we, on this topic here, on these kind of topics that we've just talked about, can we tighten up in terms of making the position very clear? Can we, is, can, can we do a, um, a re-edit or a rethinking? Or You said that you, you're going to move more into Shadi's kind of um, perspective on things. Can we reflect that in the writings, uh, Dr. Brown? Do you think that that's something we could, based on the feedback that we've been getting from, from the ground, from people that are just uh, observers and being confused by some of those words or using it as... Um, ammunition to do certain things which are Islamic or even make arguments which are Islamic okay. would be a good idea I mean I mean, I, I think that on the second thing of insulting the Prophet I mean definitely getting feedback on that was um, like you know it gave me a chance to correct what I you know correct myself um, but you know I, I also want to make it clear like I didn't write some article where I laid out this argument for why I wanted to say it's okay to insult the brother. Like, you know what, this was, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was literally, I think that was like 8 PM on a day where I had gone to high weekend. I'd given a talk in Birmingham, two talks in Birmingham, a talk in Ox high Wickham. I mean, I literally, it was like six hours of talks. It was like the end of yeah, yeah. six hours of talks. Right. I know what you mean. Um, and the Q and a, right. And, yeah, yeah. uh, and so, I mean, I don't, I, I obviously have, ex I've already told you my position on what I said, right? But I mean, yeah. it's not like I wrote some essay where I, I drew attention to this. In fact, I would actually say that if someone wanted to criticize me, they should have contacted me personally and said, hey, man, I just saw this. What do you think? Instead, just some of these people wrote, like started tweeting about this and being, look at how, how horrible Jonathan Brown is, which I actually consider to be pretty low. You know, if you really care about me, if you really care about uh, honoring the prophet, then, uh, then tell me about it. And I would have immediately had them take that out of the video, right? But instead, no, that's not what people do. They want to go and get their pound of flesh and, and insult their brother and stuff like that. So um, it, I would say about the, the thing about the LGBT issue, I think that what we definitely should do, Yaqeen, is to write another, because this thing needs to be discussed again, because the, yeah. the reality has changed so much. Yeah. And the issues have changed, right? So gay marriage is not an issue anymore. There's a lot more issues around uh, education in schools, notions of what gender is, what sexuality is, you know, uh, issues around trans oh, rights and well, stuff. There was one These thing, are much yeah. more uh, pressing. And I think that needs to be written about. What, what's uh, your view on this transgender toilets? I mean, what's... Uh, you, oh, yeah. This yeah, is, yeah. I think it's so funny. People get so upset. I don't understand people get so upset about this. So like, what when, you know, my... No, my gym, you know, we, our gym in our neighborhood, which I haven't been to for God knows how long because of this COVID-19 thing. But, yeah. you know, you go in there and it's like one room and there's like a bunch of old dudes showering, you know, totally naked. When I was in boarding school, I spent four years showering with like 20 other guys in one big room playing oh, soap cool. hockey and trying yeah. not to get peed on. That was what we spent four years doing, right? Yeah. Um. I, w I don't want that for my kids, right? I don't want, I have to take my kids to this bathroom when I go to the gym, when I take them to the swimming lessons, I have to yeah. go and be like, you know, don't, don't look, uh, oh my God. 
Can I say something? It was really funny. Yeah. Actually, I think this is okay. Like there's, there's this guy, <laughs> there's all these naked old guys in there. Right. So I'm like going through, I'm like, kind of like guys, you can't, don't look at this stuff. Right. So this one guy is standing there and my kid, thank God I taught them to speak Arabic. Cause he's like, uh, oh my God. I said like, no, and the dual is good. Like, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I was oh like so scared if he said that in English, oh it would have been the end of the world, right? <laughs> I don't know if you want to edit that out or not, but it was pretty. Uh, so my, my point is, my point is like, this is what I don't want to happen. What do I want? It's very simple. You go to a bathroom, there's a door, open the door, there's a shower, there's a toilet, or if you're not in a gym, there's a toilet, right? You go to the door, none of this like space under the bathroom, none of this you can see through the cracks. I'm not the getting doors, it. Are you saying you want men and women to be in the same toilet? No. What are you talking about? No, I don't, I'm not want, I don't want I don't want anybody I don't want anybody to be in the same toilet with anybody else. Oh okay. So what's, right so you go into a room sense? imagine this. You know in English in you go to the water closet. I want a water <laughs> closet, right? You go in there's a closet, you go in, there's a toilet, and no one else is in there. That's what I want. And that, if that's what's the if that's, comment you made about the trans thing? Also, I, I, I didn't even look at it to be honest. I just someone sent because me. I don't know because people are crazy. I'm not sure what they're yeah, yeah. what they think, but like somehow they think that I want like men and women, you know, going to the bathroom or next to each other or something. That's not what I'm saying. If you you have a sink a bathroom, it's not even a stall. Like right? it's a door. I don't know if you, you've seen this in. I don't know if you've seen this in like your universities and stuff or buildings. Right. So there's like a. In a lot of cases, there's like a men's room now and there's a uh, women's room, which has multiple toilets in them. And then there's like a, they have this like gender neutral bathroom, which is just one, it's like just one toilet. It's only one per for one person, you're saying? Yeah, that's what I want, is everything is just a bunch of one person toilets. None of this like well, multiple toilets. But what's that got to do with it? Why does it have to be gender specific? Like, why, you know, uh, what's the gender discussion about this? Because that's the same thing that a lot of trans advocates want. Or they just want that? No, I mean, they don't just want that, right? But they want, that's, okay. in terms of bathrooms, a lot of trans advocates want to have bathrooms that are just like gender neutral, single use, single stall. Uh, so you're, you're not advocating the big ones, the big, like the, the men and the women going in together, you know? No, my God, this is a, that would be, it would be a nightmare. I would never use it. <laughs> so, I mean, who, I don't know anybody who wants that. Even women are like, even women get upset about this. So like, you know, you, you can't go in and like, Women, like, you know, women go to the bathroom, they put makeup on, it's like a safe space, they talk. You so know? it's basically like a disabled toilet, what you're saying. Yes, exactly, exactly. 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 And I, I love, I go to those all the time. You can make wudu in it. No one's going to bother you. Yeah, exactly. Man. That's, that's <laughs> the like the only, only place. The sink is usually quite low, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's not a problem for me, maybe for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very, I'm very tall. This is the problem. Yeah, I but, mean, um, I've, yeah, I've seen some of your vi videos with that. Uh, you're like a black belt in Egyptian kung fu, aren't you? Right. <laughs> if only we had a martial art like that and we had civiliz we had a good enough civilization and culture to do that. What's the most libertarian government out there? I think it's South Africa, right? I don't know. I it's so probably, yeah. yeah, it's it's gonna be South Africa. And if that's the case, then we should see that you know, there's a lot of stuff going to thrive in South Africa where we're fighting these fights against really like an increasing cultural fascism, right? Yeah. And what it's doing is it's hardening, it's also hardening the Muslims, right? Yeah. And when they're hardening, whether they realize it or not, they're actually taking a lot of it out on their own kind, on people who are actually on their side, who may have made an expression or a statement that they didn't really, uh, that wasn't exactly perfect or according to them perfect or whatever. Yeah. We have this culture of uh, making Muslims, Ahl Sunnah, Duat, really uncomfortable with their own kind is a big problem. Uh, the Ba'ad, we always say, never scare your kids because your kids will then seek happiness outside of the home, right? Yeah. They'll seek security and fulfillment outside of the home. So they said, always, when you discipline your kids, rem keep that in mind. Likewise, when we have people doing commanding right and forbidding wrong and trying to get to the, the right you know, result and conclusion of things, if they do this in a way that disgusts and injures, in fact, other du'at who are of Ahl Sunnah as well, trying to do the same thing, right? Yeah. then what they're going to do is people are going to click off. They're not going to go online anymore, and many people will not benefit from them. Whereas had they had a moderate of uh, discussion with them, 
then the point would have been corrected and the people would still benefit, right? So there's yeah. every, everyone benefits. But what's going on now is, I don't know what it is, people pent up frustration with COVID-19. Why is it that Twitter, I, this is what I see, I don't know if you, you tell me, it's been taken over by these like kharajite attitudes of yeah. if you have one mistake, one thing, we're going to meme you to death. We're going to attack you. Half of yeah, these people yeah. have no names. I've they have no names. Receiving, to be honest, for me, I, I'm yeah. the receiving end of, of a lot of that, you know, my, myself. But um, to be honest, I think it's good for my class. Like, it's really good. Because when you're just consistently praised, 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 it, that's the worst thing for your, like, psycho-spiritual state. Like, sometimes you just need to get this praise. Uh, yeah, otherwise, you're just going to have but, to go. But uh, would you do that to somebody else? Is it a Mendoo yeah, action? Not, not me, yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah. there's also so, those, those guys, those rodents out there, those, those, those flies or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, these... these out there. And they have a function. And the function is to keep us all seen. Yeah, these, these cockroaches, that's, they're, they're like co sort of cockroaches and rats and hyenas. Really hyenas. Because <laughs> they like to attack someone at the moment that they're down and laugh at it. In yeah. meanwhile, we don't even know his name. He's like... Oh, uh, Ebu something or some silly name or whatever. They're bots, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, almost. Uh, I think that we really, it's hard to direct it because we're directing it at a general audience. But this yes, culture, yeah. to me, is disgusting. And it's almost it's like, yeah, no, I agree with this. Why am I part of this, you know? Yeah, it's absolutely true. And what I wanted to ask you guys is, or maybe um, as a general advice now, because you guys have spoken about some of the controversies, uh, people, I'm sure, follow some of you guys' work and, uh, I've read some of your stuff and it certainly has been effective. I mean, uh, to be, to, because we've spoken about all the controversies, like some of the stuff that um, historical analyst Jonathan Brown on slavery has, I believe, genuinely saved some people's iman. I, I genuinely believe that. And um, I haven't been so as familiar with your work until quite recently, but once again, I'm very sure that uh, people have benefited from that. Can, can I ask from you guys now, uh, for people that are suffering from doubts, I mean, this is something Yaqeen, Institute has focused on quite often, uh, quite a lot, uh, doubts and trying to rectify them. Um, what kind of things would you recommend as either actions or readings or uh, uh, for, for people that Muslims are growing up and they're a little bit confused with these topics of controversy within Islam, like slavery, like, you know, um, I don't know, Hudud, which you've also written about, uh, uh, apostasy, all these things. Um, what kind of general advice would you give, a closing advice, uh, would you give to people uh, in regards to dealing with their doubt and uh, tackling some of these intellectual challenges? Let's start with Shadi, Dr. Shadi, and then we'll go. All to right. Others. So I, I would say, look, yeah. you don't look at the specifics. Look at the source. Right. And ask yourself, do you trust in this source? Okay. Mm. If your answer is, I 100% believe in Alana's messenger right. and that their words have been protected and you know the understanding of islam and the sharia and the mainstream sharia is what they intended okay so there's two parts to it uh and i trust in allah and his messenger and i know that they are there they have more knowledge than any of us are going to have they have more wisdom they have more mercy and they're seeking benefit for humanity okay more than i will ever want those things or possess those qualities if that foundation is there, stabilized, then it's a matter of just remembering that whenever one of their rulings does not sit with my head, and I just have to remember, who, that's how simple yeah. it is. I'm not com I might not be comfortable with uh, a specific matter, then I should accuse myself because I've already entrusted, I've already trusted the foundation. And so I should remember that it's me who myself who may not understand, may, yes, temporarily feel a hardship, okay? And maybe I've, uh, uh, maybe I've misunderstood their ruling to begin with as well. So I have to look at who am I learning from because I may have been learning from someone who's not clear. So these are the points that anytime that this happens, we should go to these simple points of remember who you trust. Make sure you've understood their words properly because maybe you have misunderstood, number two. And number three, remember to accuse yourself. If you've tr uh, truly understood and I'm still feeling something, why am I feeling something? Who am I, right? Look at me and look at the universe. Allah created this universe, right? So if we just go back to the source, 
yeah. and, and realize that. And also just study with the right sources because the right sources of education may clarify what you have misunderstood about the revelation. Brian? I mean, I, I would say, you know, I would, I would start by seconding what Shadi said in the second part, which is, you know, you have to f find people you respect, uh, people who are good teachers. Um, and you have to find more than one, right? So like, you know, there's often you hear people say like, right? So like you, you have, it's, if you, you have to, it's, it's really, this is, this is, it's tough, man. It's really tough for Muslims in the West. And I mean, I think it's probably true for Muslims in the Muslim world too, but it's really, really, really tough because it's really hard to find good teachers. It's hard to find people who can, who know the tradition really well, who understand the reality around them really well, and then who understand how to put the two together. That is very, very rare. Um, but between online lectures, between people you know in your community, between books, I think there's resources out there. Yaqeen tries to be that type of resource. Uh, Shadi Safina Society tries to be that kind of resource. Shadi's teaching is, is one of those resources. Shadi's book that he's written, uh, his book on Tawheed that I have on Aqidah, which is very good. Uh, maybe you can do classes like that online, Shadi. I don't know if you already have those. Yeah, we got to do that. Put those okay. out for people, right? Yeah. Um, so finding people that you trust, and but also realizing that those are people, right? So that's why I think you have to have more than one. And, and then we've seen a lot of this, unfortunately, the last couple of years, right? Somebody puts their all their like for them islam becomes tied to this one dua da'ya this one sheikh then that person has some kind of problem and then that person then the, that muslim's iman is crushed they don't know what to do you don't remember these ulama are people scholars are people leaders are people they have their own problems they're, they're they have imperfections right and especially they face the temptations when you become a public personality you are faced with temptations that you never imagined having before that right um, uh, okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is, and this is, this is really what I've tried to hit over and over and over again in my writings and my, my lectures, which is have some humility. Our world, the, the modern world is a world of immense arrogance in which whatever the latest thing is, it's correct. It's the best. Everything else before that was wrong. And that is not... We are human beings. We are species. We are an animal. We are a rational animal. We belong to a tradition that has been around for thousands of years, that has received the wisdom of God for thousands of years, right? That has been raising kids and uh, eating food and making bread and drinking milk for thousands of years. And the idea that somehow we're going to come around and come up with some totally new vision about how we're going to think about reality and our species and our bodies and everything. And somehow that we're going to go and prescribe this for everybody else when we literally don't even know it's re it's result on our own society. I mean, look, you know, my parents and your, you know, Shadi's parents, your, they were like the hippies, you know, the sixties and seventies generation. We don't even have one full generation of people who've lived through the sexual revolution, let alone seeing what that does to their kids, let alone seeing what that, what recent developments have, uh, have done to families and to society. And to go and say that not only does everybody in the world have to live this way, but if you don't view the world this way, that you're some kind of monster, that is the pinnacle of arrogance. And it's, it's not just arrogant, it's, it's highly unwise. I mean, would you go and, and, and take a medicine and say, without even seeing its effect on someone's body over the long term, go and prescribe this for everyone else in the world and tell everyone else in the world that they're a horrible person if they don't take this medicine or accept it? This is extremely unwise. It's unwise for us as a species to make these kind of, to have this arrogance about the modern period, about the present. So that's what I try over and over again is, is if you really study the past, you realize how giant and enormous and wide human experience is, and you stop being, what makes us alone and what makes us afraid is when we look at our religion and we look at our beliefs that we're taught and we, we put them against these, these present standards that are given to us that are, that, that, that reign over us all around us and we feel terrible when you look into the past you realize that this is a long story we're not alone there's huge variety in our species and in our experience in our history and that becomes something that's comforting that's why when i wrote this book on slavery that's like i wanted to understand for myself how do i morally make sense of this like i'm not some kind of monster like i i hear about slavery it disgusts me how do i make sense of this 
as a Muslim. That's what I wanted to do. And, and what the, the conclusion I came to, which really helped me and I hope helped other people is like, it, once you realize that, you know, in the grand scheme of human history, there, these moral certainties are simply not moral certainties. Uh, that is a very liberating, it's a very liberating thing. Uh, and I think that humility, it gives you peace. It makes you a more productive, helpful member of society, a, a member of society that understands that other people might have different views than you, that you still have to live together and deal with one another, which is, by the way, something that people in our society in the UK and Britain are increasingly not willing to do, right? Okay, those are my, those are my two things, my two pieces of advice. My love bless you both. It's been a pleasant, uh, very pleasant and, and uh, action-packed podcast. And obviously, you guys are welcome at any time to join me again on this podcast. Thank you very much, man. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum, guys. Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.